Let's do some past math questions. A 62-year-old woman presents with sudden loss of vision in her left eye. Fundoscopy reveals the following. Hmm, what is this? Looks hemorrhagic. Flame, hem, flame something. We call this. What's the diagnosis? Sudden loss of vision, left eye. Looks like a lot of blood. Or elderly. Mm, if it's so bloody, maybe blood outflow is affected. So, vitreous. Eh? No, vitreous hemorrhage would be blood clots in the area. There is blood in the fundus. So, probably central retinal vein occlusion. Let's see. Yep. Central retinal vein occlusion, sudden painless loss of vision, severe retinal hemorrhages on fundoscopy. Appearance is sometimes compared to a cheese and tomato pizza. Central retinal vein occlusion, the central the retinal vein central retinal vein occlusion, CRVO, is a differential for sudden painless loss of vision. Risk factors include increasing age, glaucoma, polycythemia. Features include sudden painless reduction or loss of visual equity, usually unilaterally. Severe retinal hemorrhages are usually seen on fundoscopy. Retinal hemorrhage. Okay, next question. BNF antibiotic guidelines. So, for each or one of the following conditions, please select the antibiotic choice that best reflects current BNF guidelines. Gonorrhea, I think it's... Uh, I am ceftriaxone and it's extensive otitis externa otitis externa for coxacillin I don't know why phenoxymethylpenicillin mm. plus for coxacillin or just for coxacillin Mm. Yes, I don't know. Extensive, maybe give a bit more. Lah. Pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, give what? Lah? Pelvic inflammatory disease. I'm not sure. Pelvic inflammatory disease. I'm gonna guess doxycycline plus amoxicillin plus ciprofloxacin. Is it this one? Doxycycline plus metronidazole plus ceftriaxone. Let's see. Oh, okay. So gonorrhea, intramuscular ceftriaxone, extensive otitis externa, give flococcicillin, and pelvic inflammatory disease, give doxycycline, metronidazole, ceftriaxone. These are just stuff to memorize, I guess. First line analgesia for pain relief. And apply localized heat such as warm vanilla. Second line, total acetic acid or topical antibiotic plus minus steroid. Similar cure at seven days. If cellulitis or disease extends outside the ear canal or systemic signs of infection, start oral flucoxacillin and refer to exclude malignant otitis externa. So first line is actually just pain relief. Okay, and then what about PID? Huh? 
atrophic inflammatory disease. First line is cyphotrexone plus metronidazole plus doxycycline. Refer women and sexual contacts to genital urinary medicine. Raise CRP supports diagnosis, absent pus cells in high vaginal swab smear, good negative predictive value. Exclude ectopic pregnancy, appendicitis, endometriosis, UTI, irritable bowel, complicated ovarian cysts, functional pain. Moxifloxacin has great activity against likely pathogens, but always test for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and mycoplasma genitalium. If mycoplasma genitalium, is it mycoplasma? M genitalium test positive, use moxifloxacin. First line treatment, self triaxone plus metronidazole plus oxycycline. Second line therapy, metronidazole plus ofloxacin or moxifloxacin alone. Hmm. Looks like it's quite aggressive giving three antibiotics to cover for everything, I think. Since gonorrhea is IM self triaxone, right? I'm self on So PID you treat as gonorrhea, treat as doxycycline is for chlamydia and cover for neg gram negative at metronidazole. Right. Next question. The ward doctor is asked to review a 12-hour old neonate born at 34 weeks gestation to a healthy mother during an otherwise uncomplicated, uncomplicated vaginal delivery. On examination, the neonate looks comfortable. A continuous machinery-like murmur is noted on auscultation of the heart, as well as a left-sided shrill. The apex beat appears to be heaving on palpation. A widened pulse pressure is noted. There is no visible cyanosis. An echocardiogram is subsequently performed, which confirms the diagnosis and rules out any other cardiac problems. Given the likely diagnosis, what is the most appropriate management at this stage? So there's like two levels. So you have to first know the diagnosis. When I read, Continuous machinery like murmur sounds like a patent doctor's arteriosis. Left sided trill mm, can also happen in PDA, I guess. The apex speed appears to be heaving on palpation. Mm -hmm. And still consistent with PDA. A widened pulse pressure is noted. Systole, diastole, systole, diastole. I'm not sure why there would be widened pulse pressure in PDA though. Maybe during diastole, lots of blood flows into the pulmonary system. That's why that's a widened pulse pressure. So given the likely diagnosis, I'm assuming this is PDA. What's the most appropriate management in, at this stage? She's only 12 hours old. There's no uh, uh, echocardiogram confirms and rule out any other cardiac problems. So there's uh, solely just a PDA. So you can close the PDA safely. Right. There are some instances where they depend on the PDA to uh, cause the mixing of the blood, I think. Mm, but in this case, it's just a PDA, so you can close it up by giving prostaglandin, I think. Nope, the answer is indomethacin given to the neonate. What's indomethacin? 
So patent ductus arteriosus endometacin is given to the neonate in the postnatal period, not to the mother in the antenatal period. The likely diagnosis here, given the findings, is that of patent ductus arteriosus PDA. The correct answer is therefore giving endometacin to the neonate, as this prompts duct closure in the majority of cases. The echocardiogram ruled out other defects, however, in if another defect was present, it may be preferable to use prostaglandin E1 to keep the duct open. Oh, okay. Prostaglandin E1 is to keep the duct open until after surgical repair. At this stage, referral for surgery is thus unwarranted. Percutaneous closure may be used for duct closure in older children to avoid surgery. However, this would not be suitable in a neonate. Okay. Some notes on patent ductus arteriosus overview is a form of congenital heart defect generally classed as an asynotic. However, uncorrected can eventually result in late cyanosis in the lower extremities termed differential cyanosis. Connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending iota, usually the ductus arteriosus closes within the first breaths due to increased pulmonary flow, which enhances prostaglandin clearance. More common in premature babies born at high altitude or maternal rubella infection in the first trimester. Features include left subclavicular trill, continuous machinery murmur, large volume bounding collapsing pulse, white pulse pressure, heaving apex beat, management indometacin or ibuprofen. What is indometacin? Indometacin, therapeutic indications, non steroidal analgesic and anti inflammatory properties, active stages of rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, degenerative joint disease of the hip, acute musculoskeletal disorders, gout, lumbago, inflammation, pain, and edema following orthopedic procedures, treatment of pain and associated symptoms of primary dysmenorrhea. Since endometacin is not a simple analgesic, its use should be limited to the above conditions. Endometacin is not a simple analgesic. Should be limited to the above conditions. So it has NSAID properties. However, it's not a simple analgesic. Endometacin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent with analgesic and antipyretic properties. What did they say in the beginning? It's not a simple analgesic. Why is it not a simple analgesic? The anti-inflammatory effect is due to inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis, which is dose-related and reversible. The analgesic properties have been attributed to both central and peripheral effect, which are distinct from its anti-inflammatory activity. Do I remember that prostaglandin keeps the ducts open? Mm. Prostaglandin help you relax. But then in the uterus, prostaglandin causes contraction. No?
Fetal patency of the ductus arteriosus is an active state maintained by the relaxant action of a prostaglandin, most probably prostaglandin E2. This prostaglandin mechanism is most active in the immature ducts and decreases towards term. The ductus closes when the, this prostaglandin effect is withdrawn. Endometacin may reduce closure of the patent ductus arteriosus may induce closure of the patent ductus arteriosus of prematurity. It is most likely to be successful in, if given intravenously and early in postnatal life. Prostaglandin E1 to maintain patency of the ductus is now established in the emergency management of several congenital heart defects causing problems in the newborn. Hmm. So I need to remember prostaglandin has like opposite effects in the uterus and in the patent ductus arteriosus then. Let's look at osmosis video. Did I click on the wrong one? Patent, not patent like an invention, refers to some opening, and a patent ductus arteriosus, which I'm going to call a PDA for short, refers to a blood vessel, the ductus arteriosus, which connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta during fetal development. The ductus arteriosus is right on the aortic arch, where vessels are branching off to the brain and upper extremities. Alright, so to help visualize this, I'm going to switch to this super simplified version of the heart, since it's better at showing the relationship between the aorta, the branches, the pulmonary artery, and the ductus arteriosus. But we'll keep the more anatomical heart for reference. So this vessel, the ductus arteriosus, usually closes after birth, because the walls collapse down and it becomes a ligament, the ligamentum arteriosum. But when it stays open after birth, we call it patent ductus arteriosus, because it's still passing blood through it. In other words, it's still patent. Now, during development, the fetus doesn't use the lungs yet, and relies on oxygenated blood from the placenta that comes into the right atrium. Most of that blood actually flows through the foramen ovale, an opening between the atria. Blood that doesn't make it through the foramen ovale is pumped out of the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, at which point most of it gets sent to the ductus arteriosus to the aorta instead of to the lungs. Because remember, the fetus isn't using the lungs yet. During fetal development, the ductus arteriosus is kept open by high levels of a vasodilator called prostaglandin E2, which is made by the placenta and by the ductus arteriosus itself. At birth, a bunch of things change though. Oxygen levels in the blood go up dramatically, and the lungs become the main source of oxygenated blood. Soon after birth, the foramen ovale closes and prostaglandin E2 levels fall, causing the ductus arteriosus to close off. The lungs also start to release a small peptide called bradykinin, which constricts the Oops. Oxygen levels in the blood go up dramatically, and the lungs become the main source of oxygenated blood. Soon after birth, the foramen ovale closes and prostaglandin E2 levels fall, causing the ductus arteriosus to close off. The lungs also start to release a small peptide called bradykinin, which constricts the smooth muscle wall of the ductus arteriosus and sort of helps the process along. Within the first day, the ductus arteriosus usually starts clamping shut, and within three weeks, it's completely closed off and turned into the ligamentum arteriosum. If that ductus arteriosus doesn't close off, then the baby is left with a patent ductus arteriosus, and this condition accounts for about 10% of all congenital heart defects, of which the vast majority, about 90%, are isolated heart defects, meaning there aren't any additional congenital defects. On the other hand, a PDA can be associated with other congenital problems, for example, congenital rubella syndrome, where the mother contracts rubella virus during her pregnancy. Alright, so now we've got this still open ductus arteriosus, and we're using our lungs. Now what happens? Well, as blood pumps into the right atrium, and then goes to the right ventricle, it approaches the ductus arteriosus and has two options. Keep going down the pulmonary artery, or reroute to the higher pressure system in the aorta. Well, since blood likes to move from high pressure to low pressure, and it's higher pressure over in the aorta, it actually just keeps going onto the lungs. Then that freshly oxygenated blood comes over to the left atrium, the left ventricle, and now again it has a choice. But this time it's already in the higher pressure system, and now some of it is shunted back to the lower pressure system in the pulmonary artery. At this point, the shunt is left to right, so oxygenated blood is flowing back and taking a second unnecessary trip to the lungs. What we don't have is any deoxygenated blood escaping into the systemic circulation and causing the baby to appear cyanotic, so we call this acyanotic, which means not blue. Usually this situation is asymptomatic, and patients can have what's known as a hollow systolic, machine-like murmur, from blood moving from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Later in life though, from years of increased pulmonary blood volume, patients might develop pulmonary hypertension, or higher pressures on the pulmonary side. If that happens, pressure might eventually increase to a point where right-sided pressures are greater than left-sided pressures, and so the flow of blood through the PDA can be reversed. When this changes from a left-to-right shunt to a right-to-left shunt, it's referred to as an Eisenmenger syndrome. Now you've got deoxygenated blood flowing into the aorta, and generally heading to the lower extremities, since the upper extremities and head typically have arterial branches upstream from the PDA. This results in cyanosis in the lower extremities, a blue or purple discoloration of the skin that's the result of deoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood. This situation is actually sometimes called differential cyanosis, since only the lower body is cyanotic. Patent ductus arteriosus can actually be treated early on. Remember how prostaglandin E2 keeps the ductus arteriosus open during fetal development? Well, the drug indomethacin can be used to close a PDA because it's a type of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, and it inhibits prostaglandin E2. In some cases, the PDA might also be closed by surgical ligation as well.
Okay, next question. A 63-year-old male presents with a four-month history of an unresolved varicocele in his left testis. Initially, he was given symptomatic advice. He has now presented with macroscopic hematuria and flank pain. He describes having no energy despite being fit for his age. The testes are palpable. No discharge is elicited from the urethral meatus. His urine dipstick demonstrates blood's 3 plus but is negative for leukocytes. You send him for cystoscopy. As you are concerned, he has presented with a bladder cancer. Why bladder cancer? My macroscopic hematuria, okay. So macroscopic hematuria, you got a suspect plate, bladder cancer, but how is that related to his varicocele? Four-month history of varicocele left testes. Jacques return as normal. What's the most appropriate investigation to perform next in light of his normal cystoscopy? So the blood is not coming from his bladder. Where is the blood coming from? It could be coming from the kidneys, since he also has flank pain. But anyway, anytime you see a macroscopic hematuria, you have to check if it's from the bladder because most of the time, if it's macroscopic, it's from the bladder. So now you check that's not in the bladder. He has flank pain, probably in the kidneys. Is it related to his varicocele? Left-sided varicocele, right? So left-sided varicocele, left testicle is usually lower than the right. Um, it's more prone to varicocele and it is prone to clamping by the superior mesenteric artery. What causes varicocele? It could be a renal mass. So you can do a renal tract ultrasound. Yep. So, renal tract ultrasound is required under the two-week wait referral in an unresolving left varicocele where constant patients are suffering from renal tract cancer. This is due to the embryological anatomy linking the left renal vein and the left testicular vein. CA99 is used as a tumor marker in pancreatic cancer. CA125 used as a tumor marker in ovarian cancer. Beta HCG is used as a tumor marker for testicular cancer. So over here you have notes on renal cell cancer. Renal cell cancer is also known as hypernephroma and accounts for 85% of primary renal neoplasms. It arises from proximal renal tubular epithelium. The most common histological subtype is clear cell, 75 to 85 percent of tumors. Associations more common in middle-aged men, smoking, born hippo lin down syndrome. I don't know what's that. Tuberous sclerosis. That's where a lot of hematomas form all over the body. Features. Um, classic triad of hematuria, loin pain, and abdominal mass. Mm, pyrexia of unknown origin, left varicocele due to occlusion of the left testicular vein. Endocrine effects may secrete erythropoietin, polycythemia, parathyroid hormone, hypercalcemia, renin, ACTH. 25% have metastasis at presentation. Paraneoplastic hepatic dysfunction syndrome. Paraneoplastic. Paraneoplastic hepatic dysfunction syndrome. Also known as Stauffer syndrome typically presents as cholestasis or hepatosplenomegaly. It is thought to be secondary to increased levels of interleukin-6. Management for confined disease, a partial or total nephrectomy depending on the tumor size, alpha interferon and interleukin-2 have been used to reduce tumor size and also treat patients with metastasis. Receptor tyros ki tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for example, sorafenib, sunitinib, have been shown to have superior efficacy compared to interferon alpha. The coronal CT of a middle-aged woman with renal cell cancer, note the heterogeneity enhancing mass he heterogeneously enhancing mass at the upper pole of the right kidney yeah left normal kidney clear cell pattern of renal cell carcinoma 
Life is the normal kidney, right? It's a clear cell pattern of renal cell carcinoma. There's a clear cell pattern, clear cytoplasm, small nuclei. Incidence of renal cell cancer is only slightly increased in patients with autosomal dominant PKD, polycystic kidney disease. And let's look at the osmosis video for renal cell carcinoma. Learning medicine is and renal cell carcinomas, or RCCs, are the most common type of malignant kidney cancer in adults, generally affecting older men. Unfortunately, RCC is often considered a silent cancer because symptoms don't typically get noticed until the tumor has grown pretty large. Renal cell carcinomas form from epithelial cells in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. And this is the section of the nephron that's usually located in the renal cortex, the outer rim of the kidney. The most common type of renal cell carcinoma is composed of polygonal epithelial cells, which have funny angular shapes with at least four sides, and are filled with clear cytoplasm full of carbohydrates and lipids. And it's those lipids that give the tumors their yellow color. At a genetic level, renal cell carcinomas have been linked to mutations on the short arm of chromosome 3, or 3P. An easy way to remember this is that RCC has three letters, and it's linked to chromosome 3. One of the main genes involved in renal cell carcinomas is the VHL gene, which codes for the von hippel lindau tumor suppressor protein, or PVHL, which is normally expressed in all tissues. Mutations in PVHL can allow IGF-1, the type 1 insulin-like growth factor, pathway to go into overdrive. And this does two things. First, there's dysregulated cell growth. And second, it upregulates specific transcription factors called hypoxia-inducible factors, which in turn generate more vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, as well as VEGF receptor, leading to growth of new blood vessels, or angiogenesis. Dysregulated cellular growth and angiogenesis are a recipe for tumor formation. Renal cell carcinomas can arise sporadically, or they can be part of an inherited syndrome. Sporadic tumors are usually solitary tumors in the upper pole of the kidney, and most often happen among older men that smoke cigarettes. Inherited syndromes, like von hippel lindau disease, can also give rise to renal cell carcinomas. In this situation, the tumors typically affect younger men and women, and often involve both kidneys. Von hippel lindau disease is a rare autosomal dominant disorder, characterized by a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, which leads to the formation of cysts and benign tumors in various parts of the body, like the eye and central nervous system. The number one cause of death in patients with von hippel lindau disease, though, is the development of renal cell carcinomas. Individuals with renal cell carcinoma typically have one or more of the following symptoms. Hematuria, or red blood cells in the urine, which is most common, a palpable mass in the abdomen or lower back, and pain in the flank or near the hip bone. Since the cancer causes a state of chronic inflammation, other classic symptoms include fever and weight loss. Renal cell carcinoma is also frequently responsible for causing various perineoplastic syndromes, which is where the tumor cells generate a hormone that causes its own set of symptoms. For example, these tumors can release the hormone erythropoietin, which increases the production of new red blood cells. And this can lead to polycythemia, or too many red blood cells, which can cause the blood to start sludging or slowing down its normal flow. Another perineoplastic syndrome involves the release of renin, a hormone that's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and is involved in raising blood pressure. Some other hormones that renal cell carcinomas are known for releasing include parathyroid hormone related peptide, or PTHRP, which causes hypercalcemia, and adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, which increases release of the stress hormone cortisol and can lead to Cushing syndrome. Finally, in rare cases, a large renal cell carcinoma affecting the left kidney can butt up against the left renal vein and impede normal venous drainage of the left testes. This leads to dilation of the testicular veins and formation of a varicocele. Since the right testicular vein drains directly into the inferior vena cava, a blockage of the right renal vein by a large tumor does not usually have the same effect. However, very rarely, in people whose right spermatic vein drains into the right renal vein, renal cell carcinoma affecting the right kidney might cause a varicocele of the right testis. An especially dangerous progression of a renal cell carcinoma is its ability to invade the renal vein, where it literally grows within the vein, eventually reaching the inferior vena cava. This dramatically increases the risk of cancer spreading through the bloodstream, with the most likely targets being the lungs since that's the first capillary bed that the tumor cells would reach if they broke free of the growing mass. But also the bones, because the tumor cells have an affinity for that tissue. To determine the risk of renal cell carcinomas, each one's individually staged by the TNM system. T indicates the size of the tumor and whether or not it's grown into nearby areas, for example the renal vein. N describes the degree to which the cancer spread to retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And finally, M indicates the degree to which the cancer spread to other sites, or metastasized. Each of these categories ranked from 0 to 4, with 4 being the most severe. Renal cell carcinomas are stubbornly resistant to both traditional chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So if the tumor is localized to the kidney, surgical resection might be appropriate. In addition, renal cell carcinomas sometimes regress when they're attacked by the immune system and are sensitive to immunomodulatory agents like certain chemokines and monoclonal antibodies. Molecular targeted therapies specifically aimed at inhibiting the VEGF receptor are particularly effective because it reduces tumor vascularization, thereby cutting off the blood supply and killing the tumor. All right, as a quick recap, renal cell carcinomas form from the epithelial cells in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. These tumors can arise sporadically or as part of a genetic condition like von hippel lindau disease. Renal cell carcinomas can be tricky to treat because they're resistant to traditional chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and they're known to cause perineoplastic syndromes. Okay, next question. A 40-year-old man of African origin presents to the GP complaining that his fingers go extremely cold and white at random times of the day. It's right now's phenomenon. It is worse outdoors and particularly in the winter. On examination, you see small white deposits on his arms. That's calcinosis. There are a large number of spider nevi on his cheeks. There's telangiectasia. The skin on top of his hands is thickened. There's scleroderma. What do you call this? 
Stereo Dharma. Skin on top of his hands thicken and he is unable to completely straighten out his fingers. At present, the color and temperature of his fingers are normal. Considering the likely diagnosis, which of the following features are you most likely to see? Dysphagia is part of systemic sclerosis. Is it part of the um, Crest syndrome? Calcinosis. R is for Raynaud's phenomenon. E is for esophageal disc motility, so you have dysphagia. S is for sclerodactylin. Oh, that's the thickening of the skin of the fingers. And T is for telangiectasia. So this feature is the only one missing here from Crest syndrome. Glomerular nephritis. E. Guess you can get glomerular sclerosis in systemic diffuse systemic sclerosis, but it's not part of Crest. Serostomia, dry mouth. You can certainly have that. This autoimmune disease um, associated with Sjogren syndrome. Sometimes it can be mixed. It can have both at once. Gautron's papules is for dermatomyositis. It's not really related. Um, dilated capillary loops. Yeah, you probably can see that as well. This, this systemic sclerosis. Which one is the most likely? Sounds like dilated capillary loops would be most likely though. Because he already has Raynaud's. He may have dysphagia as part of Crest. I don't know. This, is this a trick question? Because you likely diagnosis of the following features you're most likely to see. Okay, which is more likely? Es esophageal dysmotility or the dilated capillary loops? Which is a finding in systemic sclerosis as well. I'm going to guess dilated capillary loops because from my understanding, um, it's because of uh, ischemia to the digits it causes your scant and dilated capillary loops in your nail bit, you know. Nail fold, capillaroscopy, that's what you find dilated capillary loops. Nope. So the answer is phagia. They want you to know the Crest syndrome fully. Okay, Crest syndrome is a subtype of limited systemic sclerosis and includes calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. This question describes a patient with all the features of Crest syndrome except esophageal dysmotility, which causes dysphagia. Calcinosis, white deposits. Raynaud's cold white fingertips precipitated by cold weather, esophageal dysmotility, dysphagia, sclerodactyly, thickened skin on top of the hands and ability to straighten fingers, and telangiectasia, excessive number of spider nevi. Gautron's papules are dilated, and dilated capillary loops are features of dermatomyositis. Really? Limited scleroderma does not cause internal organ involvement, and so glomerulonephritis is unlikely. <sighs> dilated capillary loops are found in dermatomyositis because in dermatomyositis they have Raynaud's phenomenon as well. Usually, uh, dilated capillary loops is found more often in people with scleroderma as well. And so, glomerulonephritis nephritis is unlikely. Xerostomia uh, means dry mouth and is a feature of Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren can overlap with the connective Tissue, other connective tissue diseases, but this is less likely than this phagia, which is part of the syndrome. Hmm. It's not a very good question, is it? Is there anybody who found that by the nearby, not the same as I was thinking this too. Actually, I commented too quickly. Spider nevi are in fact a type of telangiectasia and also known as spider telangiectasia. The more you know. Isn't trick thickened skin scleroma not crest? Hmm. Don't you get dilated? New bed, clappery loops with systemic sclerosis as well? Yes, you do. I don't get anything. Hmm. 
think it's a problem with the question. They want you to know crest, but they don't care about pathophysiology of dilated capillary loops. Or maybe I got the pathophysiology wrong, not sure. Anyway, next question. A 24-year-old woman is reviewed in the genital urinary medicine clinic. GU Medicine Clinic, she presented with vaginal discharge and dysuria. 24-year-old woman revealed in the genital urinary medicine clinic, she presented with vaginal discharge and dysuria. Microscopy of an endocervical swab showed a grand negative caucus that was later identified as Neisseria gonorrhea. This is her third episode of gonorrhea in the past two years. What is the most likely complication from repeated infection telling inflammatory disease? Is it available here? Infertility, which is a complication of pelvic inflammatory disease. Infertility secondary to pelvic inflammatory disease is the most common complication of gonorrhea. It is the second most common cause of PID after chlamydia. Arthropathy may occur, but is far less common. Lymphogranuloma venereum is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Here are some notes on gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is caused by grand negative diplococcus Neisseria gonorrhea. Acute infection can occur on any mucous membrane surface, typically genital urinary, but also rectum and pharynx. The incubation period of gonorrhea is two to five days. Features include in males, urethral discharge, dysuria, female psoriasis, leading to vaginal discharge. Rectal and pharyngeal infection is usually asymptomatic. Microbiology, immunization is not possible and reinfection is common due to antigen variation of type 4 pili, proteins which adhere to the surface, and OPA proteins, surface proteins which bind to receptors on immune cells. Local complications that may develop include urethral strictures, epididymitis, and self-angitis, hence may lead to infertility. Disseminated in infection may occur, see below. In management, give ciprofloxacin. Hey, ciprofloxacin is used to be the treatment of choice. It's a uh, fluoroquinolone. No, it's ceftriaxone, I think. Is it? Hey, wait. Gonorrhea, yeah, I am ceftriaxone. This to be the treatment of choice, however, there is increased resistance to ciprofloxacin, around 36% in the UK, and therefore cephalosporins are now more widely used. There was a change in 2019 British Society for Sexual Health and HIV BASH guidelines. Previously, first-line treatment was IM ceftriaxone plus oral azithromycin. The new first-line treatment is single dose of IM ceftriaxone 1 gram, no longer at azithromycin. If sensitivities are known and the organism is sensitive to ciprofloxacin, then a single dose of oral ciprofloxacin should be given. I think last time they uh, they recommended I am ceftriaxone plus oral azithromycin because it's a common infection. the The theory is that uh, people are commonly infected with both gonorrhea and chlamydia at the same time, so you treat both at the same time. Uh, but I guess since 2019, which is quite recent, so they only use IM ceftriaxone instead of treating both. If ceftriaxone is refused, for example, needle phobic, then oral cefixim, 400 mg, single dose plus oral azithromycin should be used. Disseminated gonococcal infection, DGI, and gonococcal arthritis may uh, also occur, with gonococcal infection being the most common cause of septic arthritis in young adults. The pathophysiology of DGI it is not fully understood, but it's thought to be due to hematogenous spread from mucosal infection, for example, asymptomatic genital infection. Initially, there may be classic tryout symptoms, tenosynovitis, migratory polyarthritis, and dermatitis. Later complications include septic arthritis, endocarditis, and perihepatitis, Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. Key features of disseminated gonococcal infection, uh, tenosynovitis, migratory polyarthritis, and dermatitis. Lesions can be macular, or vesicular. Let's look at the osmosis video. Learning medicine is first. This gram negative Ulceria gonorrhea, also known as N gonorrhea to its friends, is a gram negative oval bacterium that infects humans, causing a number of infections, including gonorrhea. The word Neisseria comes from Neiser Albert, a German physician who discovered it. While gonorrhea is from the Greek words ganos, which means seed, and ro, which means flow, meaning flow of seed. An illustration referring to the penile purulent discharge. 
which was mistakenly thought to be semen in infected males. Now, a little bit of microbe anatomy and physiology. N. gonorrhea is a gram negative bacterium because its cell wall has a thin peptidoglycan layer and so it doesn't retain purple dye used during grams because of which means a German physician who discovered it. While gonorrhea is from the Greek words ganos, which means seed, and rho, which means flow, meaning flow of seed, an illustration referring to the penile purulent discharge, which was mistakenly thought to be semen in infected males. Now, a little bit of microbe anatomy and physiology. N. gonorrhea is a gram negative bacterium because its cell wall has a thin peptidoglycan layer and so it doesn't retain purple dye used during gram staining. Instead, like any other gram negative bacteria, N. gonorrhea stains pink with safran and dye. N. gonorrhea typically live in pairs called diplococci. Stacked side to side so the pair looks like a coffee bean. They're also non modal, non spore forming, and obligate aerobes, which means that they absolutely need oxygen to grow. Finally, they're catalase and oxidase positive, which means that they produce both of these enzymes. N. gonorrhea grows on a special chocolate medium called Thayer Martin Auger, which mainly consists of sheep blood. Mm, yum. Some antimicrobials, like vancomycin and nystatin, are usually added to the Thayer Martin Auger to inhibit the possible growth of undesired bacteria or fungi and maximize the growth of Neisseria species. However, other Neisseria species, like N. meningitidis, have the same properties, so the maltose fermentation test is done to differentiate the two. The gist of it is that the N. gonorrhea can ferment maltose, whereas N. meningitidis can. To check for this, a pure sample from the culture of the suspected bacteria is transferred to a sterile tube containing phenol red maltose broth, which is then incubated at 36 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Since N. gonorrhea can ferment maltose, the solution stays red, whereas with N. meningitidis, fermentation byproducts make the solution go yellow. Now, unlike its sister, Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria gonorrhea is not an encapsulated bacteria, so it does not have a polysaccharide capsule. But this bacteria has a ton of other virulence factors, which it uses to attack and destroy host cells, and also to evade the immune system. First, N. gonorrhea has pili. These little thread-like extensions radiating from the bacterial surface. The pili help N. gonorrhea attach to a host mucosa surface. Also, they help bacteria get physically connected with each other, making what's known as a conjugation pilus, which is a hollow tiny rod through which bacteria can swap genetic information back and forth, including antibiotic resistance genes. Interestingly, N. gonorrhea pili are made of antigenic proteins which can vary with every infection, what's known as phase variation. Alright, so normally when a certain bacteria causes an infection, the immune system keeps memory of the bacterial antigen's configuration. So if the same bacteria infects again, the immune system remembers it and quickly makes specific antibodies against it. However, since N. gonorrhea changes the antigens on its pili each time it infects a host, the immune system cannot produce a quick specific immune response. Phase variation is also the reason why there's no effective vaccine against N. gonorrhea. Pili aside, other virulence factors of N. gonorrhea include toxins. The very important one is IgA protease, a toxic protein that this bacterium uses to destroy immunoglobulin A, or IgA. IgA is an immune system protein that's normally found in the mucosa secretions, like those produced by the vagina or the cervix. IgA helps with bacteria opsonization, meaning it takes the bacteria so that neutrophils can recognize and destroy them. So IgA protease neutralizes the first line of mucosal defense. However, not all IgA molecules get neutralized, so some N. gonorrhea bacteria are still opsonized and end up getting attacked by neutrophils. Inside the neutrophil, N. gonorrhea is wrapped in a phagosome, a bubble inside which reactive oxygen species, like hydrogen peroxide, are released to kill it. However, N. gonorrhea releases catalase, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide. Unfortunately, this translates as a win for N. gonorrhea, which now takes over the neutrophil and uses its energetic resources to multiply. The neutrophil eventually becomes too full and bursts open, letting out a ton of bacteria in the bloodstream, which is known as gonococcemia. Inside the blood, N. gonorrhea can use other virulence factors. First, there's a cell wall antigen called lipooligosaccharide, or LOS, which is known for its ability to trigger a widespread immune reaction that results in sepsis, meaning blood vessels dilate, so blood pressure drops, and vital organs don't get enough blood. And one final virulence factor of N. gonorrhea is its ability to do silylation, a process by which N. gonorrhea wraps its LOS cell wall with sialic acid, the same molecule initially found in the host cells. This helps bacteria to hide its LOS antigen, making itself anonymous to the host defense mechanism, like camouflage. As if it wasn't enough, N. gonorrhea can spread from the bloodstream to other parts of the body, like the joints or the heart. Most frequently, though, N. gonorrhea causes gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted infection. In males, gonorrhea manifests as urethritis, or inflammation of the urethra, but it can also affect the prostate, causing prostatitis, or the epididymis, causing epididymitis. In females, N. gonorrhea can also cause urethritis, but most frequently it causes vaginitis and cervicitis, so the inflammation of the vagina and cervix, respectively. Through the cervix, N. gonorrhea can spread to the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and sometimes even the ovaries, causing pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. Finally, PID can cause a complication called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, which happens when the inflammation spreads to the peritoneum, and from there to Glisson's capsule, which surrounds the liver. This results in violin string adhesions, or thin strings of scar tissue that attach the liver to the peritoneum. If N. gonorrhea infects pregnant women, it can spread to the baby during vaginal delivery, and results in early neonatal conjunctivitis, so a type of conjunctivitis that affects the newborn two to five days after birth. N. gonorrhea can also cause some rare but serious infections, often as a consequence of gonococcemia. When the infection spreads to the joints, it might cause gonococcal arthritis, which is more common in sexually active adolescents. If it spreads to the heart, it might affect the heart valves, causing endocarditis. N. gonorrhea can also cause some rare but serious infections, often as a consequence of gonococcemia. When the infection spreads to the joints, it might cause gonococcal arthritis, which is more common in sexually active adolescents. If it spreads to the heart, it might affect the heart valves, causing endocarditis. The first symptoms of Neisseria gonorrhea infection are related to the genital infection. In men, there can be a burning sensation when urinating, as well as clear urethral discharge, which can become purely. And bloody. In women, there's usually thick, white, purulent vaginal or urethral discharge, which can also turn bloody sometimes. If the infection progresses to PID, there might be lower abdominal pain and fever. Alternatively, with neonatal conjunctival, also clear urethral discharge infection. In men, there can be a burning sensation when urinating, as well as clear urethral discharge, which can become purulent and bloody. In women, there's usually thick, white, purulent vaginal or urethral discharge, which can also turn bloody sometimes. If the infection progresses to PID, there might be lower abdominal pain and fever. Alternatively, with neonatal conjunctivitis, there can be swollen eyelids with mucus and pus discharges from the eye. In gonococcal arthritis, there's multiple joint inflammation which results in painful swelling of the wrists, ankles, and elbows. With gonococcal endocarditis, there might be fever, chills, sweating, and malaise. 
Diagnosis is usually done with a vaginal or urethral swab, which is then smeared on a slide for biochemical tests and gram staining, which reveals pink coffee bean-shaped bacteria within neutrophils. Growing the bacteria on Thayer Martin Auger is required for confirmation, but nucleic acid amplification testing, or NAT, can also be done, and this consists of identifying the bacterial genetic material. Treatment for N-gonorrhea infections is with third-generation cephalosporins, typically ceftriaxone. However, it has been found that gonococcal infections are frequently associated with a chlamydia trachomatis co-infection, so usually azithromycin or doxycycline are given along with cetriaxone to also cover chlamydia. Finally, since gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection, it can be prevented by using condoms during sex. All right, as a quick recap, Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative diplococci that grows best on Thayer Martin Auger. It's non-modal, non-spore forming, oxidase positive, catalase positive, and maltose negative. It lacks a capsule, but has other virulence factors like pili and proteins like PIL-C, OPA, and IgA protease. Most frequently, N gonorrhea causes gonorrhea, which commonly manifests as urethritis in males and vaginitis and cervicitis in females. Left untreated, N gonorrhea infections can progress to gonococcemia and cause complications like gonococcal sepsis, septic arthritis, and endocarditis. Treatment is with ceftriaxone, and azithromycin or doxycycline are also given to cover a possible chlamydia co-infection. Thanks for watching. If you're interested, synovitis, migratory polyarthritis, and dermatitis. Joint, skin, tendons. Next question. A GP partner receives a letter from the General Medical Council asking to receive a scanned copy of all patients' medical records due to an ongoing medical negligence investigation and fitness to practice hearing against a foundation ear doctor who worked at her practice six months ago. The patient in question attends the practice for regular follow-ups. The next time the patient is in the practice, one of the GP partners discusses the request with the patient. The patient refuses to allow this to happen as he believes it would be in an invasion of his privacy. After an extensive discussion about his thoughts towards this, he still refuses. What should the GP partner do next? Anonymize the patient's record and then share it with the GMC and tell the patient you are going to do this. Apologize to the GMC as she is not able to share the record. Ignore the request from the GMC. Share the entire record of GMC and tell the patient you are going to do this. Speak to the patient and his next follow-up two weeks later and see if he's changed his mind. I think can anonymize. Nope. The answer is to share the entire record. Disclosures to comply with the statutory request made by a regulatory body such as the GMC can be made without the patient's consent. So why are you telling the patient then? The GP partner did the correct Okay, so I did the correct thing here by speaking to the patient first about the sharing of their personal information. This is one of the situations where despite what the patient may say, a doctor is obligated to respond to the request. It's good practice to still speak to the patient beforehand and see if they may agree to the disclosure. Since the GMC is a regulatory body, uh, it can make statutory legal requests that can be fulfilled without the patient's consent. Therefore, the correct answer is to share the record with the GMC. However, once again, it's not necessary but good practice to tell the patient what you have done, especially if it's going, to, uh, going against what they wanted. Apologizing to the GMC as she is not able to share the record is inappropriate as legally she is required to refill, fulfill the request despite what the patient says. Anonymizing the patient's record and then sharing it with the GMC would not be appropriate. The GMC has asked for information on a certain patient and even if it is anonymized, they will know who the information is the information is meaning her efforts to anonymize it has gone to waste equally there is no need to do this as it will only cause inconvenience for her and also for the gmc ignoring the request from gmc will be inappropriate as she is neglecting a legal duty as a, and a statutory request which is for very bad practice 
Speaking to patient at his next follow-up two weeks later to see if he's changed his mind is not an inherently bad or inappropriate option. However, it's not the most appropriate. There is no need to delay the request to see if he changes his mind. It also may seem like she is trying to coerce or pursue him uh, to agreeing to the request, which would not be beneficial to the doctor-patient relationship. Okay. Next question, a three-year-old is admitted with fracture involving the physis, metaphysis, and epiphysis of the right tibia. According to Salter-Harris classification, what type of fracture is this? So Salter-Harris type 1 is S, slip, just the physis is involved, just only epiphysis separation. S is slipped, A is S A L T R, so this is a mnemonic. A is above, L is lower, and T is true and true. So this is Salter Harris type 4. Okay. Salter Harris 4 fractures are a pediatric fracture through the physis, metaphysis, and epiphysis of a growth plate with poor prognosis. This fracture is Salter Harris 4 fracture since it involves the physis, metaphysis, and epiphysis of the bone. More detailed outline of the Salter Harris classification is in the notes below. And over here you can see type 1 is fracture through the physis only, x ray often normal. Type 2 is fracture to the physis and metaphysis above. Fracture through the physis and epiphysis to include the joint below the lower. Type 4 is fracture through physis, metaphysis, epiphysis, true and true. Type 5 is a crush injury involving the physis. X-ray may resemble type 1 and appear normal. As a general rule, it's safer to assume that growth plate tenderness is indicative of an underlying fracture even if the X-ray appears normal. Injuries of type 3, type 4, and type 5 will usually require surgery. Type 5 injuries are often associated with disruption to growth. Features of non-accidental injury includes delayed presentation, delay in attaining milestones, lack of concordance between proposed and actual mechanism of injury, multiple injuries, injuries at sites not commonly exposed to trauma, and children on, at, uh, on the at-risk register. When you have pathological fractures, genetic conditions such as osteogenesis imperfecta may cause pathological fractures. Right. So that's all. Let's test 10 questions. See you in the next one.